Thank you for being with us this afternoon. It's very exciting, uh, this event. Kind of a culmination of our week-long symposium on critical thinking. Uh, I want to welcome everybody who is with us today, either here live in person or uh, live streaming, including our colleagues and students at our Panama City, Florida campus. Welcome to everybody. This afternoon's presentation marks the end of the 2019 Critical Thinking Symposium, Truth and, and Misinformation in Media. The week started with a Rhodes Scholar presentation by Dr. Alan Luden of Wake Forest University and ends today with our keynote address delivered by Glenn Kessler. In between, we've held more than 13 events for students, faculty, staff, and the general public. There have been escape rooms and fake news jeopardy. <laughs> escape room? Oh, no. <laughs> Faculty panels on teaching critical thinking skills, discussions about developing critical thinking skills in lower division courses, and presentations by librarians on detecting faked videos and detecting deceptive data and statistics in news. This symposium is an outcome of our quality enhancement plan that FSU approved and implemented in December 2014. Our plan outlined our commitment to enhancing critical thinking skills among our juniors and seniors. To date, 45 grants have been distributed to our faculty in all 17 of the colleges and schools that are offering undergraduate degrees. We have projects on the Panama City campus in Florida and on our campus in Panama City in the Republic of Panama. So far, more than 6,000 students have uh, directly participated in courses that have been modified to enhance critical thinking skills, and that number continues to increase. In addition, faculty and staff have written and presented about their efforts in venues both nationally and internationally. I think it's fair to say that cr the Critical Thinking Initiative has had a significant impact on all of FSU's campuses. Faculty have changed the way they teach, how they ask questions, and how they assess student learning. I want to thank today uh, Len Hogan, who's our director of our Quality Enhancement Program and all his wonderful staff, and the planning team that made this event uh, happen today and all the events of the week. Uh, I think that uh, they've made a a giant contribution to our university and to the betterment of our students' experiences while they're with us. We've made a commitment early on to put the information that we gathered as part of our QEP, or Quality Enhancement Program, uh, to work. The Critical Thinking Symposium is one example of that obligation. And of course, President Thrasher is a big champion of this initiative, and we're glad that he's with us here today. So it's now my pleasure to introduce President John Thrasher. Well, thank you. It's a, it's a really a, it's really a treat to be in this building. It really is. I, I was reminiscing a, a little bit before I got here about back in the early 60s, uh, this building actually had a swimming pool in it, right? Everybody knows that over by the, where the dance studio is. It had a bowling alley in the lower level, a one lane bowling alley that uh, you had to set the own, your own pins up. I mean, that's just how long ago it was, right? I mean, that I was here. This is, a, this is an incredible building, and, and Glenn, we're just honored that you would be here today for us. I, I want to thank Sally and uh, thank uh, her for her, her office and herself, obviously, for the great support for, of today's speaker and, and this week's event. They've been, they've been fantastic. And I'm so pleased that, frankly, we're putting the spotlight on critical thinking. I, I just really come back uh, just about a half an hour ago from the legislature uh, down there talking about uh, money, as you can imagine. But uh, uh, they need a little critical thinking down there, and we were trying to deliver it. But this, uh, as Sally said, this has been a key to, to Florida State's philosophy since it opened its doors as a seminary west of the Suwannee back in 1851. We've always felt strongly that a college education should not be a, a passive experience and that uh, students simply need to learn uh, what others already know. That's, that it's, it's part of that, and they need to be engaged in that kind of thinking. 
It should be uh, an active experience, obviously, uh, where students can challenge the status quo. Uh, we do a lot of that around here, I know that. I know my staff does that. I think they've been to all these classes, uh, Dr. Bradley. I think they've been to critical thinking classes and I get challenged every day by our staff and our, and our faculty about where we're in, the, are we going in the right direction? And uh, to look at old problems in new ways. And that's what this is about, to find innovative ways to, to, to find solutions. Our quality enhancement uh, plan reflects this philosophy. It encourages our faculty to help students develop these skills. Uh, employers tell us all the time that they like to hire FSU graduates because they know how to think critically, they know how to communicate clearly, and they certainly know how to solve complex problems. And that's, believe it or not, regardless of the discipline, those are one of the, those are the things that employers, I believe, are actually looking for also, in addition to the technical knowledge that you have in your particular specialty. The focus on this week's symposium, uh, Truth and Misinformation in the Media, could not be more timely as the nation actually looks forward to the 2000 20 elections, and I think all of us are looking forward to that and making sure that we participate as, as citizens, as part of our civic responsibility. All of the symposium's uh, unique and engaging programs were based on the work uh, that's done by our faculty, and I want to thank uh, Beth Boatwright of the uh, University Libraries for spearheading that organization, the organization of this week's events. Thank you so much, Beth. We appreciate it, absolutely. <laughs> And of course, you know, putting on a symposium of this magnitude requires uh, uh, an entire campus. It takes, it takes a lot of folks uh, in, our, in our campus community to come together. And here, just the example of the, of the co-sponsors, the Office of the Provost, of course, our libraries, our Oglesby Union, our Division of uh, uh, Student Affairs, our University Communications, our, uh, our academic and Center for Academic and Retention um, always are here. Uh, our Center for Leadership and Social Change, the Center for Advancement and Teaching, the Graduate School, the Program for in, uh, Instructional Excellence, and the Division of Undergraduate Studies. So all of them have participated in putting together this great program for this, uh, this particular week. So now it's, it's really uh, to get to the, to, the, to the main event. Uh, it's now my honor to introduce today's speaker. Uh, He's a, uh, an award-winning journalist whose career has spanned uh, more than three decades. Uh, Glenn doesn't look that old, but uh, I, uh, he's, he's and, and to go through what he's been through, I guarantee he looks darn good. Uh, he has covered foreign policy, economic policy, the White House, Congress, politics, uh, airline safety, uh, and Wall Street. And any one of those, any one of those would be enough for, for a career, obviously. He was the Washington Post's uh, chief uh, State Department reporter for nine years, traveling around the world uh, with three different secretaries of state. Uh, before that, he covered the tax and budget policy uh, and then also served as the uh, newspaper's uh, national business editor. He's the author of The Confidant, a highly acclaimed book on former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice. Since 2011, Glenn has been the editor and chief writer of the Washington Post column, The Fact Checker. On a daily basis, he examines the statements of political figures and diplomats to discern truth behind the rhetoric. I'm glad he wasn't here when I was in the legislature. <laughs> it's no easy task, I can, I can promise you that. If the statements fall short, uh, Glenn explains why and awards, uh, and we've, we've all heard of this, obviously, and awards many as four Pinocchios uh, to the offending party. Uh, so we're pleased, we're very pleased to have him here today to present uh, his, his topic, uh, Dig Deeper, Fact-Checking, Critical Thinking, and Political R Rhetoric. I know all of us, and I particularly uh, include myself in that, uh, are looking forward to hearing his message, so please welcome Mr. Glenn Kessler. Thank you for inviting me to speak to you. It's a real honor. Since this is a university audience, I thought I would start with a statistic that many of you may have heard before. More than 1,800 students die every year of alcohol-related causes. 
Here's how the Washington Post used that statistic in an article. Quote, Senate backers said that a prohibition on grain alcohol sales is a priority for college administrators eager <clears throat> to curb the sort of heavy drinking that causes more than 1,800 alcohol-related deaths of college students each year in the United States. But as I often tell people, be wary of what you read in the news, especially numbers, even in the Washington Post. Where do the figures come from? How is the data collected? How accurately is the research being reported? In this case, when I <clears throat> investigated the source of the number, it was not based on a survey of college students, and it actually had nothing to do with binge drinking. In fact, I discovered that the National Institute of Health, which had developed the statistic, was misusing the source of much of its data, alcohol-related motor vehicle crashes. NIH assumed alcohol was the cause of the crash, but it turns out that an accident was labeled as an alcohol-related crash if there was any measurable alcohol in any participant in the crash, even a bicyclist who was hit by a car, and even if the alcohol level was well below the legal level for impairment. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration had emphatically warned that its data did not mean that alcohol consumption caused the crashes. But it turned out the NIH had no idea they couldn't use that data in that way until I pointed out the error. So as far as I could tell, in terms of alcohol poisoning from binge drinking by college students, the actual number of deaths appears to be about three dozen, which is a far cry from 1,800 that had often appeared in media reports. Now, I normally write about politics, not data about alcohol poisoning. So as an introduction to what I do, I thought I would show a brief video that we produced for the 10th anniversary of the fact checker. Other than the fact that Governor Romney ran a, a uh, relentlessly negative campaign uh, of falsehoods, uh, which earned one of his ads four Pinocchios from the Washington Post. A uh, quick response. Yeah, I, I can't let that stand. She's been given four Pinocchios for that as well. Well, when the Washington Post fact checker examined this claim, they gave it four Pinocchios. I am four Pinocchios, which is the worst rating possible. In 2015 alone, without my even asking, they gave me no fewer than eight Pinocchios. The Washington Post did a partisan fake news hit piece and gave me, the voter fraud victim, a four Pinocchio score on truthfulness. I better say think, otherwise they'll give me a Pinocchio. And I don't like those, I don't like Pinocchios. If you're talking specifically about WikiLeaks, we have one example, which we use, of Glenn Kessler, as you know, from the Washington Post. We don't quite say 10th anniversary. If we did say 10th anniversary, we'd have to give ourselves a Pinocchio, because there was a brief period, a hiatus of a couple of years. Politicians speak in code words, they twist uh, information in order to advance their agendas. And so if you're a regular reader of the fact checker, we think that you'll get, come away with a better understanding of complexity of foreign policy or domestic policy, healthcare policy, any kind of policy issues. Where are the fact checkers? Where are the fact checkers? Pinocchio. So compare Hillary and Donald Trump. In terms of fact checking, Hillary Clinton is like is like playing chess with a real pro. Fact checking Donald Trump is like playing checkers with someone that's not very good at it. It's pretty boring. It, you find Donald Trump boring? Yes, his facts are so easily disproven. There's there's no joy in the hunt. All right. The Fact Checker was originally launched during the 2008 campaign as a temporary feature started by my former colleague, Michael Dobbs. Now, before doing the Fact Checker, Dobbs had been a distinguished diplomatic correspondent. And when the editors of the Washington Post approached me in 2011 and asked me to revive the Fact Checker as a permanent feature, I had been the chief diplomatic correspondent of the Post for nine years. So you might wonder, what does writing about diplomacy and foreign affairs have to do with political fact checking? The answer is that diplomatic reporting requires close scrutiny of words and phrases 
in order to determine their deeper meaning. Diplomatic statements often obscure the reality of the situation. You have to learn how to crack the code. For instance, a diplomat might emerge from a meeting and say the two countries had a frank exchange of views. That really means they were screaming at each other. When I was covering the State Department, one of my editors said to me, Kessler, I just realized you write about fog. Sometimes it's light fog, sometimes it's dark fog, but it's still fog. And so since diplomats are trying to obscure differences and smooth over trouble spots, a good diplomatic reporter has to be attuned to even the slightest changes of wording. One of my biggest scoops was when I reported that the Obama administration was prepared to let U.S. officials meet one-on-one -on -one with Iranian diplomats to discuss the nuclear issue. Under the Bush administration, such contacts were forbidden. The story appeared on the Post website, and I immediately got an anxious call from a White House official asking, how did I know this? The answer is, I've been posing the same question for weeks to a senior American diplomat. Will the Americans talk to the Iranians? The answer was, always, no, we're not going to do that. Then at a news conference, I asked again, and his answer was subtly different. To the untrained ear, it still sounded like no, but I knew he was sending me a signal that the administration's position had changed. So with confidence, I was able to write an authoritative article. Fact-checking the statements of politician, all, politicians also involves decoding messages. Politicians and interest groups use facts and figures to buttress the arguments for whatever policy they're advocating. I look upon politicians as salesmen. And just like most people would not buy a used car without checking under the hood, neither should people accept what a politician says who advance his or her policy preferences without checking out the facts. In politics, you only succeed if you win. And after more than 30 years of covering government, politics, and diplomacy, I have found there's little difference between the two main parties on one key issue. They will both stretch the truth if they believe it will give them a political advantage. And that is the rationale behind the fact tracker, which I write with two colleagues. At least five days a week, we take a detailed look at a politician's statement and examine the facts behind that claim. And then we make a ruling, ranging from one to four Pinocchios on how truthful the statement is. It's kind of like a reverse restaurant review. <laughs> so one Pinocchio is selective telling of the truth. Some omissions and exaggerations, but no outright falsehoods. For instance, Democrats often assert that women earn 81% as much as men. Now that's a statistic from the Commerce Department. I mean, I'm sorry, for Census data, Commerce Department. So that's a legitimate source. But it's just one of many ways to measure this problem, and it happens to be the worst. Differences in the life choices of men and women, such as women tending to leave the workforce when they have children, make it difficult to make such simple comparisons. If you adjust for various factors, the gap is not 19%, 19 cents, but could be as little as 5 cents. Two Pinocchios means significant omissions or exaggerations. Some factual error may be involved, but not necessarily. A politician can create a false, misleading impression with, by playing with words and using legalistic language that means little to ordinary people. As an example, Senate Democrats in 2017 claimed that Supreme Court nominee O'Neill Gorsuch should have met a standard, so-called, the standard was their word, of 60 votes for confirmation. Now, it only takes a simple majority, 51 votes, to be confirmed for a position in the Supreme Court. So what were they talking about? 60 votes was a reference to the number of votes needed to end debate on a nomination if one ch side chooses to launch a filibuster. But a filibuster in a Supreme Court nominee was a rather rare event. It had only happened four times in US history. In fact, two of the Supreme Court justices on the court at the time, Samuel Lito, Lito and Clarence Thomas, were confirmed with fewer than 60 votes, 58 for Alito and 52 for Thomas. So the Democrats were being slippery with their language. 60 votes is not a standard for Supreme Court confirmations, but Gorsuch would have needed 60 votes to proceed to a confirmation vote if the Democrats had decided to engage in a rarely used parliamentary tactic. And of course, as you know, they did try to go that route, and the Republicans responded by cha changing the rules to allow a simple majority vote. Now, three Pinocchios is significant factual error and or obvious contradictions. This is when things get increasingly untethered from reality. For example, during the primary debates in 2016, Texas Senator Ted Cruz said that studies found by the Marines found that putting women in combat ended up increasing casualties both among women and among men, 
and a decreased military effectiveness. So we looked into this. It turned out only one study had been done by the Marines, and it actually said nothing about the presence of women in units and the impact of casualties in the, within the unit. The report did say that women were prone to more injuries on the job, which reduced combat readiness, but Cruz ignored the other findings in the report, such as the fact that women overcame their reduced height and weight by using creative problem solving, something men don't do very well. So Cruz completely twisted the results of the study for political purposes. Now, four Pinocchios is for Whoppers. And frankly, that's just about everything Donald Trump says these days. I have never encountered a politician so cavalier about the facts as President Trump. Now, just about every politician earns a four Pinocchio rating at some point. It's maybe one or two times out of every 10 rulings. Hillary Clinton, for instance, earned four Pinocchios 15% of the time. Uh, often when I had to fact check what she said about emails. Donald Trump earned four Pinocchio ratings 65% of the time during the presidential campaign. And now that he's become president, his unfortunately his record is not, no better. The list of misstatements is endless. He said he watched thousands of Muslims in New Jersey cheer to fall with the World Trade Center. I looked into it. There is no TV footage, no newspaper coverage, just scattered unconfirmed reports of five or six people celebrating and they were not necessarily Muslim, and they were probably only teenagers excited about a day off from school. He said the wives of the 9-11 attackers were sent home from the United States before the attacks. All but one of the attackers was unmarried, and the wife of the unmarried, of the, uh, sorry, the wife of the married terrorist had never visited the United States. Trump even claimed during the campaign he would save $300 billion a year in Medicare by negotiating for prescription drug prices. That was a neat trick. Medicare only spends $78 billion a year on prescription drugs. It was more than fuzzy math, it was fantastic math. Trump said he received just a million dollar loan from his father and turned it into a $10 billion empire. First of all, most experts who've looked at the numbers say he's not worth 10 billion, maybe at best 3 billion, probably much less than that. But more to the point, his father gave him more than a single million dollar loan. Trump inherited tens of billions of dollars we used to think it was about $40 million, but a recent New York Times investigation revealed it was many more times than that. His father guaranteed a $70 million loan on Trump's first big project, the Grand Hyatt in Manhattan. In researching the matter, I found many other loans as well, including the fact he borrowed $9 million from his father's estate. Most famously, when one of Trump's casinos was teetering on the edge, unable to make a mortgage payment, his father bought $3.5 million in gambling chips and did not use them. The hotel then used the cash to make the mortgage payment. Gambling regulators said later that was an illegal loan. Now that he's president, Trump's proclivity for making false claims continues unabated. He falsely says that millions of undocumented immigrants voted in the election, just enough to give him the edge in the popular vote, but there's no evidence to back that up. He accused President Obama of wiretapping him, again with no evidence. He takes credit for budget savings, such as $600 million on a Lockheed jet fighter that he had nothing to do with. More than 100 times he claimed he passed the biggest tax cut in US history. I looked into it. It ranks in eighth place. The president is also an amazing flip-flopper. During the campaign, he constantly claimed the unemployment rate is 42% when it was actually under 5%. He also touts stock market highs, even though during the campaign he claimed the booming stock market on Obama was a bubble that was soon to pop. He used to brag about how apprehensions at the southern border were dropping, saying it was evidence he was doing a great job. But then the number spiked. So now he says it's also a proof he's doing a great job. Uh, I'm gonna now show a video about how the president manipul manipulates data depending on the political moment. Let's see if I can do this. Under Republican leadership, America is booming, America is thriving, and America is winning again, winning like never before. We're respected again. We're respected again as a nation. President Trump often uses data to support his case for America's sudden success. Uh, the job market at 3.7% is the lowest in 50 years. It's the best.
unemployment numbers we have in 50 years. But just three years earlier, he warned supporters not to believe the official rate. I mean, you could have a 30 percent unemployment rate, real rate. I'm talking about a real rate. An economist and a very smart guy two weeks ago said the real number is 42 percent. So let's say that's high. But let's say it's 30 or 25 or 20 or 15. One thing we know, it's not 5.2, 5.3. The thing is, the unemployment rate has steadily been declining since 2009. Trump's rhetoric about job growth is similar. People wanting to get jobs is a mess, despite the numbers. You know, you hear numbers, but you have millions of people out there that want to get jobs they can't get jobs because we don't have good jobs. Now he says the opposite. We've created 4.5 million new jobs since the election, a number that was unthinkable. If I would have said that during the campaign, oh, they would have given me a hard time. In reality, slightly more than 4 million jobs have been added since Trump took office. And more jobs were created in every year of Obama's last term than Trump's first. Trump has even used both sides of the same statistic to prove one point. As you know, the border's down 78 percent. Under your past administrations, the border didn't go down, it went up. And you got bad dudes coming in, but they're not coming in with us. We have set records on arrests at the borders, nobody even close. Both claims are made about the same data set. Trump just flipped the script to present the rosy picture. The president rarely shies away from the chance to highlight his success, even when it means manipulating data to tell a better story. So at the Washington Post, we have been keeping careful track of his President Trump's statements. At last count, he has made almost 9,500 false or misleading statements in the first 801 days of his presidency. That's an average of nearly 12 claims a day. Even more astonishingly, even after Trump has been proven wrong, he goes out and repeatedly says the same false claims over and over again. Most politicians would quietly drop a false talking point. Mitt Romney, for instance, in 2012, used to say the United States was the only country in the world in which people put their hands on their hearts during the singing of the national anthem. After I gave him four Pinocchios in a column that included YouTube clips of people around the world singing the anthems with their hands on their hearts, he never said it again. On rare occasions, we give a Geppetto checkmark for a completely truthful statement it does not happen often, but hope springs eternal. We, we tend to reserve this category for claims that are unexpectedly true. As an example, Bernie Sanders tweeted earlier this year, the Walton family makes more money in one minute than Walmart workers do in an entire year. My first impression was no way. Bernie, after all, tends to be a little fast and loose with his statistics, but I checked. The Walton family earns $25,149 a minute in dividends. Assuming a 40-hour work week, your average Walmart worker makes $24,960 a year. So Bernie earned a Geppetto. Now, I will readily admit the Pinocchios are a bit of a marketing gimmick. It's not especially scientific, and it's open to subjective analysis. The line between two and three Pinocchios is sometimes fuzzy. But I do find it to be a useful tool for maintaining consistency over the months and weeks and years of writing columns. One key goal of my column is to help consumers of news become better judges of fact-based statements. I want to help readers become more discerning about hearing the weasel words and caveats that politicians routinely insert in their statements in order to present a more rosy or dire picture than the facts would suggest. One of my favorite examples is when President Obama declared, Chrysler has repaid every dime and more of what it owes the American taxpayers for their support during my presidency. Now, every dime and more sounded like such a bargain, and it kind of made the president sound like a used car salesman. Not only did Chrysler pay back the loan with interest, but the company paid back even more than they owed. But then you see that Obama snuck in the Weasel Awards in my, during my presidency in a statement. So what did that mean? It turned out Obama was only counting the $8.5 billion loan he made to Chrysler, not the $4 billion loan that George W. Bush extended in his last month in office with Obama's support. In reality, U.S. taxpayers did not recoup about $1.3 billion of the entire $12.5 billion investment when all was said and done. So under the president's math, Chrysler paid back 100% of Obama's loan and less than 70% of Bush's loan. A more honest presentation would have combined the two figures to say U.S. taxpayers got back 90% of what they invested. Obama thought he got away with this by inserting the words, in my presidency, in the sentence. But I gave him three Pinocchios. Now, many of the worst 
claims or in television advertisements. I'm now gonna show two ads released in 2012 about Mitt Romney's record. One from the Obama campaign, one from the Romney campaign. I like to show these ads because amazingly, they both rely on the same data to make their claims. I'm Barack Obama and I approve this message. It started like this. I speak the language of business. I know how jobs are created. But it ended like this. One of the worst economic records in the country. When Mitt Romney was governor, Massachusetts lost 40,000 manufacturing jobs, a rate twice the national average, and fell to 47th in job creation, fourth from the bottom. Instead of hiring workers from his own state, Romney outsourced call center jobs to India. He cut taxes for millionaires like himself while raising them on the middle class and left the state 2.6 billion deeper in debt. So now, when Mitt Romney talks about what he'd do as president, I know what it takes to create jobs. Remember, we've heard it all before. I know how jobs are created. Romney economics. It didn't work then, and it won't work now. Mitt Romney on day one. The difference is strong leadership. As governor of Massachusetts, Mitt Romney had the best jobs record in a decade. Romney reduced unemployment to just 4.7%. He balanced every budget without raising taxes. He did it by bringing parties together to cut through gridlock. From day one as president, Mitt Romney's strong leadership will make all the difference on jobs. I'm Mitt Romney, and I approve this message. I always hoped that these ads would appear right after each other so voters were completely confused. So what's going on here? It depends on how the ad makers manipulated the statistics from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. The Obama ad says that Massachusetts fell to 47th in the nation. That was a blended rating over four years, and like Obama when he was president, Romney started his governorship in tough economic times. So a blended figure brings down the overall record. The Romney ad, which said he had the best record in a decade, was not comparing him to other states, but to previous Massachusetts governors. That's a pretty low bar. The Obama ad says Romney raised taxes and fees. Romney says he raised no taxes. The key word there is fees, because Romney did not really raise taxes, but he did boost fees dramatically, which some people would say was a stealth tax increase. The Romney ad says he balanced four budgets. The Obama ad says he increased the debt by 2.6 billion. Massachusetts, like just about every state, requires a balanced budget. The governor has no choice and state debt is largely different than national debt. This is mostly for capital investments, though Romney did continue a trend of paying for some operating expenses out of debt. So these ads are good examples of how the same data can be spun in different ways. But sometimes ad makers mislead by omission. I'm gonna play a small clip from a pro-Obama film narrated by Tom Hanks and it involves the death of the president's mother and suggests that is why he was motivated to work for a health care law against the odds. But he faced a fierce opposition, hostile to compromise. It'll be a cold day in hell before he socializes my country. After months of negotiation, it was unclear whether he could get the necessary votes. Some advised him to settle. He could still claim victory if he accepted less. I regularly told him, look, you don't have to spill this much political blood. You won't get the health care accomplishment you're seeking, but you will have something. But he knew from experience the cost of waiting. When my mom got cancer, she wasn't a wealthy woman, and it pretty much drained all her resources. She developed ovarian cancer, never really had good, consistent insurance. That's a tough thing to deal with, watching your mother die of something that could have been prevented. I don't think he wants to see anyone go through that. And he remembered the millions of families like his who feel the pressure of rising costs and the fear of being denied or dropped from coverage. Well, this was very touching, but it's very misleading. 
It's an interesting example of how snippets of interviews can be arranged to leave a particular impression without actually being individually untrue. The sequence evokes a famous story that candidate Obama had told during the 2008 campaign, that his mother, Stanley Ann Dunham, fought with her insurer over whether her cancer was a pre-existing condition that this disqual quali sorry, disqualified her from coverage. Here's how he put it. Quote, for my mother to die of cancer at the age of 53 and have to spend the last months of her life in the hospital room arguing with insurance companies because they're not saying that this may be a pre-existing condition and they don't have to pay her treatment, there's something fundamentally wrong about that. But the story was later called into question, after the election, by Dunham's biographer. The fact that Obama's initial claim is not directly repeated suggests the filmmakers knew there was a problem with the campaign story but they clearly wanted to keep some version of it in the film. What actually happened is that Obama's mother had a dispute over disability coverage. Disability insurance helps replace wages lost to an illness, but her health insurance actually covered most of her expenses from ovarian cancer. The film does not directly repeat the claim that Obama's mother was denied health insurance because of a pre-existing condition, fighting for treatment in her hotel room. But look at what it does say. Hanks says the president knew the cost of waiting on reform. Disability insurance, however, was not an issue in the health care debate. Second, the president said the cancer, quote, drained all her resources. Health insurance actually paid for most of her bills. So this was not a case of someone being bankrupted by tens of thousands of dollars in bills. Her salary for working for a non-governmental organization in 1995 was $82,500, which is the equivalent of $136,000 today. Michelle Obama said Dunham, quote, never had good, consistent insurance. It's unclear what she means by this. Maybe that Dunham had different jobs, some of which did not provide insurance, but she actually had good coverage when the cancer was discovered. The First Lady also suggests that death, quote, could have been prevented. But again, it was not an insurance issue. Before going overseas for a position in Indonesia, Dunham was too busy with work and had skipped an important test recommended by her doctor that might have spotted the cancer earlier. Then an Indonesian doctor diagnosed her problem as appendicitis and removed her appendix. By the time cancer was finally discovered, it was third stage. And finally, Hanks says Obama's family felt, quote, the pressure of rising costs and the fear of being denied or dropped from coverage, maybe for disability payments, but not for health insurance. So as you can see, there's nothing technically inaccurate, but it all adds up to highly misleading and I gave this three Pinocchios. Increasingly, even local congressional campaigns have become nationalized. But I would warn you that cookie cutter ads and attacks can actually undermine candidates. Voters are increasingly sophisticated about political attacks and can spot something when it's not authentic. In the 2018 midterm elections, ads produced by the National Republican Congressional Committee, the Congressional Leadership Fund, which was associated with then speaker Paul Ryan, and individual Republican candidates all charged Democrats for supporting a universal health plan backed by Bernie Sanders, even if the Democrats are not supporters of the Sanders plan. Here's a video we put together. When Anne was in the hospital, we thought we may lose everything. I earned my Social Security and Medicare benefits, and I want Washington to keep their hands off them. Elaine Lurie has quietly committed to step towards a big government health care takeover. Government takeover of health care. A big government takeover. And that's a $32 trillion budget buster. And cost of $32 trillion. $32 trillion. $32 trillion. And explode the national debt. It almost double, double the national, national debt. debt. Experts say they'll have to double everyone's taxes to pay for it. Making employer coverage illegal. Brindisi's plan would be Medicare, Medicare as we know it. We know it. Now, there are certainly Democratic candidates who supported Bernie Sanders' plan. One could have a legitimate debate about whether it makes sense to completely transform the healthcare system along the lines envisioned by Sanders and how such a transition would be financed. 
Some Democratic candidates have, may have straddled a line between expressing support for a single-payer concept and the current system, which some of these ads seek to exploit. But other, others had been clear they did not support Sanders' plan. So it was simply absurd to tag all Democrats with the same broad brush, and I would argue it backfired in the end. Now, one reason why Republicans tried to make an issue of Medicare in the last election is because they were under fire for their failed effort to repeal Obamacare. Many House Republicans voted for a repeal bill, but then they were left high and dry when it could not advance in the Senate. But there were a few Republicans who voted against the repeal bill. So here's an example of a Democratic ad that tried to artfully get around that fact. pre-existing condition, Brian Fitzpatrick sold you out. Brian Fitzpatrick sided with Donald Trump and the insurance industry. He voted against protecting people with pre-existing conditions three separate times. All of these votes had to do with parliamentary actions, not final votes. When it came time for the vote to repeal Obamacare, Fitzpatrick bucked his party and joined Democrats because he said he was concerned about the impact on people with pre-existing conditions. The DCCC really crossed a line here. They are in four Pinocchios. So as, the ad, as our video showed, Fitzgerald Fitz, Fitzpatrick bucked his party to vote against one of the president's top priorities, the repeal of the Obamacare, specifically because he was concerned about the impact on people with pre-existing conditions. His reward? Being attacked for selling his constituents out on the issue because of minor procedural votes when just about every member of Congress sticks to party lines. The vote that really counted on pre-existing conditions was the tough one, and on the proposed law itself. I wrote at the time, you would think the Democrats would at least applaud him for his courage, but apparently that's not the way the game is played these days. One of my favorite parts of the job is debunking statistics that have somehow become part of the national conversation. I started off by noting the statistic on alcohol abuse among college students. Here are some others which involved going through the, some strange, down some strange rabbit holes. Democrats often say that 40% of guns are sold without background checks. But that's not true. When I first investigated this number, it turned out it was derived from one telephone survey of 250 people done in the early 1990s. So it had a huge margin of error. Then when I obtained the original survey results and drilled down into the data, I discovered that a lot of the guns that did not have background checks were gifts or inheritances. inheritances. Those transactions already are exempt from background checks. It would stay exempt even under recent proposals to tighten the law. I concluded the number of guns purchased without a background check was about 14%, not 40%. That number was confirmed when researchers at Harvard redid the survey in 2017 in response to my fact check. The number of guns purchased without a background check, 13%. Then there was the claim that human trafficking was a $9.5 billion business in the United States. I've debunked a lot of human trafficking statistics over the years. It's a horrific crime but there's little data and advocates who fight trafficking often cite flimsy numbers. But advocates do more damage to their cause when they use inaccurate statistics. In this case, politicians said that this $9.5 billion estimate was from the FBI. And they could point to a State Department report in 2016 that said it was an FBI number. So when I called the FBI and asked, can I see your data, they said, no, that's not our number. And the State Department couldn't tell me where they got the number. I finally concluded that the $9.5 billion figure came from congressional testimony in 2004 by an official at ICE, but it was not for profits from human trafficking in the United States. He was talking about profits for human smuggling around the world. Smuggling, of course, does not involve the use of force or coercion. Unfortunately, because of the State Department's error, the $9.5 billion figure had been wrongly cited as an official FBI estimate for human trafficking in books, congressional research reports, and many other studies. And like I said, the State Department has no idea how they made this mistake. 
More recently, I investigated a statement that Amnesty International estimated that about 60% of migrant women are raped as they journey through Mexico. You probably read it in news reports during the debate over President Trump's wall. The Washington Post even used this number in one of its news reports on the front page. So I got curious. Where did this come from? Well, it turned out this was not an Amnesty International estimate. It had been misreported for years, including by Amnesty. Where did it come from? I first traced it to a 2010 report issued by Amnesty International. So already you can see there's a problem. A statistic cited by the media in 2019 comes from a 2010 report, meaning the data could be old. Buried in the report is this line. Quote, it's a widely held view shared by local and international NGOs and health professionals working with migrant women that as many as six in 10 migrant women and girls are raped. The sentence had a footnote, so I followed that. This time, the source was a 2002 report in Spanish written for the UN Population Fund. So now the statistic is getting older. When I located the UN paper from, 20, from 2010, I discovered that the amnesty report had cited the wrong source and then had mischaracterized it. The UN paper said, quote, 60% are subjected to some form of sexual abuse during a trip, ranging from sexual coercion to rape. Okay, so now it was a figure about sexual abuse, not just rape. That UN paper in turn cited as its source a book published in 1998 by a refugee organization sponsored by the Catholic Church in Guatemala. In other words, the statistic was now more than 20 years old. I couldn't find the book in a library, but it was for sale on Amazon. So once it arrived, I eagerly turned through the pages to find the source of the data. Imagine my surprise when I read this. Oh, hold on. Uh, it said, quote, a study of migrants estimates that 60% of the illegal female immigrants have some sort of sexual experience in their trip to the U.S. from rape to coerced sexual relations to a lover. In other words, the original source of the 60% statistic included not just rapes or sexual abuse, but also the experiences of women who may have had a boyfriend on the journey, whether out of necessity or desire. And to top it off, the book provided no source for this alleged study, and when I located the author, he could tell, not tell me where he got it. But in any case, the figure came from interviews supposedly conducted a quarter century ago, making it completely irrelevant now. This is an example of academic telephone tag, where each reference to the statistic takes you further from the original meaning. That is why you should, you should always check the footnotes to see where the data comes from. More recent studies I located indicated the percentage of women raped as they travel through Mexico is about 10%. That's still high, but it's much less than 60%. What's the lesson from these examples? If a statistic sounds too fantastic or extreme, there's probably a good reason for that. Now, in recent years, interest in political fact-checking has exploded around the globe. In 2011, there were just three, four fact-checking organizations in the world, three of which were in the United States. Now, there are more than 150 fact-checking organizations in just about every country in Europe and Latin America and it is spreading across Africa and Asia as well. 22 countries have more than one fact-checking organization. It turns out that voters in many countries want to hold politicians accountable for their statements and promises. The internet has empowered non-governmental groups and journalistic organizations to challenge politicians and even bring accountability and journalistic rigor to countries without much of a tradition of press freedom. These groups are able to spread their reports through social media at a fraction of the cost of traditional newsprint-based media. I helped craft an international set of principles to guide this movement going forward, which included committing to fact-check all political parties, fairly and without favor. Members of the International Fact-Checking Network, which agree to these principles, are assessed every year by outside experts to make sure the organization is living up to these principles. Now, one question I frequently get from non-journalists is how do I prevent my own personal political beliefs from swaying the rulings I make on statements by politicians? I think it's a funny question, because as a journalist, I am trained to let the facts lead the way, rather than whatever personal beliefs I might have. But I can understand how in this highly partisan age, people can be surprised that personal beliefs do not play a role in reporting. But that's the way it works in journalism. The facts matter, not the politics. 
In fact, I challenge anyone to read the fact checker for a month, and I guarantee you, you will not be able to figure out my personal political beliefs. I'm tough on everyone, and have managed to annoy just about every interest group in Washington. During the campaign, anti-gun groups became riled because after Clinton said in a debate that 33,000 Americans died from guns every year, I noticed in a fact check that 60% of gun deaths in the US stem from suicides. Anti-gun groups thought that fact was irrelevant. But there was actually no documented link between suicide and access to guns, according to the National Academy of Sciences. In fact, Japan has the toughest gun laws in the world and the highest suicide rate. Expanded access to information has many advantages, but the, technical, sorry, the technological changes also have come at a cost. Newspapers and evening news shows used to provide Americans with a common point of reference. Now Americans are increasingly sorted into ideological cul-de-sacs, able to decide if they want their news slanted left or right. The internet, in other words, has helped open a world of information and facts for Americans. But that freedom is wasted if Americans are content to absorb facts and political analysis that match their blue or red political inclinations. We seem to have gotten richer with information, but poorer in knowledge and understanding. I hold politicians to an especially high standard because I believe they have a responsibility to use facts and figures that are beyond reproach, especially in this increasingly partisan divide. We can argue over policies, but we should not have to argue over facts. And if a politician has to manipulate the facts in order to sell his or her policy proposal, then maybe there's something wrong with the policy rather than with the facts. But actually, the responsibility rests with you. Diversify your social media feeds. You will learn more from people who challenge your assumptions and preconceived notions. Be open to new ideas, but don't jump to conclusions. And always dig deeper. And now I'm happy to answer any questions. Any question? Hi, thanks for your uh, work with the fact checker and for talking to us today. So I'm, I'm uh, really interested in, in a couple different things that could be going on in fact checking, right? So we can check whether something is true or we can do this more sophisticated thing with, that you're talking about where we um, see whether something is technically true but maybe misleading. But then I'm also interested in this like further step where it, it, uh, we kind of evaluate maybe the structure of the argument uh, that the facts are supposed to be plugged into, right? Where we think, look, even if this was true, would the conclusion that somebody's trying to argue for actually follow? And I'm wondering if you see that as part of the role of a fact checker, or if, or if that kind of goes beyond the, the scope of fact checking. Well, um, you know, there, it's, I think it's situational. Uh, I mean, one of, the, one of the things, and the people who are critics of what I do harp on it, uh, sometimes we'll, we will make an issue out of something being taken out of context. So, because uh, it could be a quote unquote true fact, but without the, but in, in context, it really doesn't mean much. So for example, uh, the president always likes to say that right now more Americans are working than ever in history, which sounds great, but it actually has nothing to do with employment. It just means the country is bigger. I mean, there are more Americans than ever before in history. And the number of people working, except for when you hit a recession, the number of people working is always hitting all-time highs. So that's an example of where you have to, you can't just say, oh, well, it's a true fact. You know, we have to say, in, here's the context and why this quote-unquote fact is not uh, really informing you of anything. Hi, I have a question about uh, trust of people like the public like the trust between people in the public and journalists because i feel like over the past decade or so there's been like this fractured trust between the public and as journalists and like as a journalist myself since like write, i write for the college newspaper it's this thing where people are always suspicious of you when you want to um like interview them or you're saying what you're covering especially with something political and i was just wondering like in this current like era, like my generation has known nothing but partisan news. Like I don't know what nonpartisan news looks like. And so I'm wondering like how, like how we can combat that and how we can like restore trust if that's even possible. Yeah, I don't know. It's, um, it's tough. 
uh, particularly when the president is always saying that, you know, accusing the media of fake news. Um, you know, he uses the term fake news to describe articles that he doesn't like. Uh, you know, uh, at the Washington Post, we really do not produce fake stories. We might produce incorrect stories, or we might produce stories that got something wrong, which we then try to correct as soon as it's pointed out. But, you know, if you were to invent a source, that's a fire in offense. We don't invent sources. If you were to write something that you knew was incorrect, that's a fire in offense. So, you know, we try very hard to be accurate uh, and careful and balanced, uh, but we're also humans. Uh, I often say, you know, it, it's both for journalism and also politics. You know, when it looks like conspiracy, it's usually incompetence. Uh, and, you know, I, I think a lot of times reporters, this is almost my guide to young reporters, because a lot of times reporters might say, ah, oh, the politicians have done this, done that. And it's, it's really just incompetence, you know, what the politicians did. Same thing with bad stories or screwed up stories that emerge from newspapers. Uh, uh, often it, there's a whole bureaucratic explanation as to how something like this happened. Um, so in terms of restoring trust, I mean, the best thing is just to be as accurate as you can and to be as fair-minded as you can. Um, uh, I, you know, we really try hard to do that at the fact checker. We don't, we, you know, uh, we really don't play favorites. And in fact, I'm very excited with the upcoming uh, election because now we, we've been stuck having to do lots of fact checks of Republicans and have got a little unbalanced. So now we're going to be doing lots of Democrats. Um, though they seem, the one un, a bad thing from fact checking is that so far the Democrats, in order to strike a contrast with Trump seemed to be really trying to be careful with their facts. So <laughs> a couple of times I've called them up and they said, all right, we'll drop that from our talking points. We won't say it anymore. <laughs> I think this actually kind of follows. I thought it was interesting um, that you mentioned that you don't know what an unbiased news source looks like. I don't necessarily expect any news source to be unbiased, but when you um, talk about filter bubbles and you talk about ideological cul-de-sacs, I feel called out. I'm guilty of that as well. But I have tried. I have actively sought out other perspectives. I don't know how to diversify my social media. I want specific <laughs> recommendations of an ideological spectrum that does hew to facts. And I was wondering if you had any recommendations on either side of our kind of bifurcated political spectrum um, that you would recommend to diversify my social media. Do you have any specific oh, recommendations? Oh, what an interesting question, boy. Uh, uh, hmm. uh, well, so I think that um, uh, well, uh, trying to. <laughs> well, I, I'm just trying to. I don't want to like you know. Um, You put me on the spot here. I, I yeah, 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 yeah. So I subscribe to Washington Post. I occasionally read articles from the Wall Street Journal, and that is as close as I can get to reaching out by filter uh, because I don't think that much beyond that. Well, is okay. Well, uh, more than one source. Well, I think. On either side, well, yeah, I. I very uh, yeah. Okay. Well, I mean. So, you know, the Wall Street Journal articles are different from the Wall Street Journal editorial page. So the Wall Street Journal articles are just straight journal journalism. It, it's, they're, um, you know, that it's very different from the editorial page, which tends very much to the right, just like the editorial page of the New York Times leans to the left. The Washington Post editorial page is kind of socially liberal, or is domestically liberal and conservative on foreign policy. It's kind of in the middle. But there, there's really a, like what we call it in journalism, a Chinese wall. The editorials don't. So when I was saying diversify your social media feeds, it was less about, you know, what uh, news source to look at and more about looking at columnists that would challenge your thinking. So if you tend to, are you on the left side, I guess? Okay, all right. Well, then, um, you know, uh, the uh, uh, 
Well, for instance, so he, unfortunately he passed away, but Charles Krautheimer, of the, of the, who was at the Washington Post, was a really distinguished, very thought-provoking writer from the right. So, um, you know, and you, uh, so, and, you know, the New York Times has a guy, uh, Brett Stevens, I think, who's kind of playing that role at the New York Times. The, the, the one problem we faced at the Post with our conservative columnists is that virtually all of our conservative columnists hate Donald Trump. So you suddenly had like all the liberals saying Donald Trump is horrible and all the conservative columnists. So we actually went out and hired some columnists that like Donald Trump just to provide. So there's this guy, Hugh Hewitt, who writes for the Washington Post, who is very much always trying to find the absolute bright side of whatever positive side of what Donald Trump is doing. There's a guy at the Washington Post named Mark Tiersen, who is conservative. Uh, set, Pearson, who is, um, uh, you know, Trump skeptic, but often trying to find the right way of looking at things. Uh, it unfortunately went out of business, but the Weekly Standard was a really good uh, news magazine about politics with a conservative slant, uh, but, you know, rigorously reported. So that's what you want to look at. There's the, on the, there's, there was a publication... Um, called The Federalist, which is also very conservative and tense, but it, it was weird. It was started out vaguely anti-Trump. It's now kind of positive Trump. The funding is a little obscure. So I, I you know, but on the other hand, if you want to like just read things that are different from your perspective, yeah, well, I mean, the, 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 I mean, the Federalists have been extremely skeptical of the whole investigation of Trump in, in, uh, and, and Russia. And, uh, and, but what I find, um, you know, particularly their, their criticism of, of the media uh, is always really interesting to read and thought-provoking. Like, a lot of what they do is critical of the things that we at the Post or the Times do. And I make a habit of reading it just to get a different perspective and just understand how, you know, someone who on the outside is assessing our coverage. I don't always have to agree with it, uh, but there are times also when I look at it, well, you know, that's, that's worth thinking about. Glenn, I want to ask you a question just about the industry itself. Uh, and I think this goes to a lot of what you're, you were talking about, about, you know, clarifying opinions and facting of different folks. But I, in Tallahassee, just as an example, and, and around our state, I'm seeing a demise of the, of the uh, newspaper industry, where we used to have a robust uh, group up here uh, looking out and doing investigative reporting, that, that type of fact checking on an individual basis, I think is diminishing. And I, I wonder uh, your opinion of what is the future of the of the newspaper industry, and how uh, how is it going to be the kind of fact checker it ought to be for all of us who are interested in civics and government and all that? If we have the demise of of this particular industry, and to get to her question, and we have to rely on the other sources, which obviously are in many instances slanted and 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 certainly you'd have to do your own fact checking to, to check what they say on a, on a more and more people are going to that because I think we, we are losing the robust newspaper industry that we've had in America for a long time. Yeah. Well, that is a very concerning issue. Uh, there was someone, I forget who said it, but they were quoted as saying, there's never been a better time to be a corrupt local politician uh, because you don't have the, the scrutiny and the local coverage. That, I mean, there was a statistic I saw this week uh, that Cleveland Plain Dealer just laid off a bunch of people and their staff is now 32. It used to be, a, 10 years ago, it was a staff of 320. So just, and Cleveland is one of the biggest cities in the country. So imagine what is being missed. Uh, I, I don't know uh, what the future will bring. Um, the future for the Washington Post was starting to look a little grim there until we got a new owner uh, who um, uh, it seems to be doing all right. I, 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 I often say that since he bought the Washington Post, his net worth has gone up $100 billion. 
uh, though I just read that he had to give 25% of it to his, to his ex-wife, uh, uh, who still leaves him with about $100 billion. <laughs> uh, so, um, the, um, uh, so, you know, but that's, you know, and, you know, so that has really helped us in, you know, really expand our coverage uh, overseas and, and, and in the United States, uh, and it, I think is a really important time. Um, and, you know, there's now a, a new billionaire, dollar, billionaire owner of the LA Times who seems to be investing in that. I don't th say that the solution is, you know, billionaires have to suddenly, you know, adopt newspapers around the country, but um, there's an uh, organization called ProPublica, which is uh, also financed by some very wealthy people, uh, and it does only investigative journalism, and they've announced that they're going to start partner, doing partnerships with local newspapers to uh, investigate uh, things going on there. And in fact, they, they, it's funny, when they announced uh, they were going to start doing this in Kentucky, the then uh, the Republican governor got very upset about these outsiders coming in. But the first investigation they did exposed all sorts of malfeasance by Democrats. So <laughs> it just shows that, um, you know, this is what good reporting could do. So maybe that's a possible model where, where you have uh, the local people are supplemented with the work of, of people like that. I have a question uh, for you from our Panama City campus. Um, they wrote in, uh, it seems that one of the main challenges in courage in critical thinking is the extent to which people are ignorant of the idea of a filter bubble. Their behavior on the internet and in real life shapes the information they encounter and often um, leads them to information that they're most interested in or that might confirm what they already believe. So what do you think is um, perhaps uh, either the most significant challenge or, or perhaps a good idea that would help us um, educate people about the ways in which they're being targeted by information or misinformation, or how could we best help them break out of information silos? And is social media helping or hurting? Yeah, well, <laughs> it's, it's a double-edged sword. And, um, and that's why I was saying we have access to more information, but we seem to have uh, become less informed. Um, you know, there's lots of social science research that shows that people are more receptive to information that confirms what they already believe. Uh, and it's just like, you know, you never notice the car ads until you're in the market for a car and suddenly you, all you see on TV are car ads. So it's just, it's like, you know, if you, so there was actually a really amazing study done where they, um, it's kind of complicated, I won't get into details, but they were able to demonstrate that, that people that were, you know, leaned left or leaned right we automatically look at numbers a different way if it confirmed what they already what they already believed, even though ma they mathematically they understood it was wrong. They just couldn't believe that information was pre presented to them that conflicted with what they believed. So it really is incumbent on us as individuals to work on this and to think about it and just say, you know, you know. How do I get out of the information silo? I mean, the question, I'm going to now start thinking of a list of people to recommend on Twitter, because because that's a, that's a really good question. You know, how do you do that? And the thing is, you can, um, uh, you know, you don't have to necessarily agree with it, but you just have to expose yourself to different kinds of thinking and different kinds of ways of looking at the world, in part to also understand that this is, you know, it's not only to understand people who think differently from you, but also just to get a better understanding of their worldview. Uh, I mean, the big problem, I think, in the United States now is that people are so upset and so angry and feel the other side as evil, and that is exploited by politicians, um, uh, particularly, um, you know, if you, it's a, it politically exploits our elderly population who are constantly bombarded with what I call meta scare ads. And, you know, both the Republicans and Democrats have proposals that would try to restrain the growth of healthcare spending, which is threatening to really hurt the federal budget. And, you know, when you guys, you know, you, we don't want to have it around when, when you guys are ready for retirement. So, 
and yet the the way and and you can argue over the policy and say, well, we don't like the way to do this, we don't like the way. But the problem is, no matter what the other side proposes, everyone says hey, they're going to take away your Medicare. When it's actually just approaching it from different ways. So it, rather than say, let's see if there's a way we can actually resolve this problem, it just becomes a political, you know, sword. And uh, you know, you can't look at the other side as total evil. To just you know think differently, and you got to figure out how they think differently, didn't you? Hi. Um, yeah. Thanks for everything you're saying today. It's very interesting. But I'm always interested in how things work. And so how do you get your job done? How many staff do you have working with you? What type of staff? And do you use any type of software that combs through voting records of politicians or what bills they've supported? Well, let's see. It's, um, it's basically, it's a staff of, of uh, at the moment, it's, uh, it's myself, it's another reporter. There's a video editor who also reports. We've also had gotten recently this year a $250,000 grant from YouTube to allow us to expand our video fact checks. So we have another video person, at least for this year. Um, and the interesting thing is we actually have far more uh, viewers of our videos than readers of our fact checks. It's just another, and, and, you know, and we, I'm constantly looking for different ways to to um, you know, reach people on different platforms. Uh, we, uh, during the campaign, we, had vi we even had uh, Snapchat fact checks, which were wildly popular at the time. So it's just a way to get the information out. And so right now it seems like video people really like to look, watch videos on their phones. And so um, uh, that's, a, that's a, so it's, it answer is for people, <laughs> I guess I should say. Uh, so and we have like a, we actually have a special YouTube series. It's a new episode each week, uh, which you can subscribe to. Um, the in terms of you know, each day, often we don't know what we're going to fact check until we walk in that morning. Uh, we get a lot of uh, uh, re suggestions from readers uh, that are contacted us and are puzzled by something. Uh, we look for things that are in the news that are newsworthy, that allow us to expand a little bit about policy, to explain how things work. Um, there is an effort in the fact-checking world to try to automate some of the ability to find statements to find. So there's a, there's a uh, project that's managed by Duke University, which every morning sends us possible quotes that appeared on Twitter or on CNN uh, the day before. You know, and the computer has been trained to look for things that might be a possible fact check. So we sometimes will use material from that. Um, and uh, you know, it's it, it, actually they're more advanced overseas. In Argentina, they actually have an automated thing that combs through all of the legislative parliamentary debates and automatically identifies things to fact check. Hi. Um, Oh. My, uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, my question is related to one of the YouTube video on Washington Post. So it's basically, it was uh, about the Green New Deal. And uh, the reporters who were presenting that said, when there was a website which described the possibilities of uh, some misinformations presented in the website by the, by the house or the group, and then they later took it down at a different time. Because of that confusion, which was presented a misinformation and later it was removed, the reporters from Washington Post said they are not going to award any Pinocchios for this situation. But the problem was already the information from those websites have been shared and said, okay, this is the bias by the Washington Post. So how do you resolve that kind of an issue? Well, I think the, uh, the reason we didn't end up giving Pinocchios they could, we, we offer an opportunity to uh, people when we fact check that if you admit you made a mistake, we're not going to award Pinocchios. I mean, if people make mistakes. Uh, we're not trying to play gotcha. Uh, most politicians do not take us on that offer. Uh, they would rather get the Pinocchios than admit they made a mistake. Uh, but in that case, um, the, uh, uh, the office of Ocasio-Cortez said that, you know, they, you know, what happened, just so people understand, 
Yeah, there was the Green New Deal, which is, you know, legislative text, and the AOC staff tried to put up a, tried to put together an FAQ, which would explain, answer questions. So in a sense, it was trying to go beyond the dry text of, of what, you know, stuff that looks, a lot of the bills in Congress are, are, or resolutions are incomprehensible to most people, so we were trying to do an FAQ. But the FAQ included some kind of, you know, sardonic humor, such as eliminate, talking about eliminating cows or eliminating airfare, uh, airplanes, uh, which, you know, it was just total catnip for opponents of this, and they've tried to exploit it. You hear the president talk constantly about how the Democrats want to eliminate cows and planes. Uh, but it was, it was posted, and then they, they claim it was a, like an early draft, and it was a mistake, and they pulled it down. So pretty quickly, actually. Um, so in that case, you know, it doesn't always have to result in Pinocchios, and we, we deser determined that you know, since they told us we made a mistake and we've withdrawn it, which is what you're supposed to do. A lot of times people leave documents up on the web. The only way you can find this is to go in the Wayback Machine. It did not seem like an occasion for Pinocchio's. Well, I'm gonna cut the conversation. Glenn is gonna hang around for a little bit, but I hope you'll join me in saying thank you to Glenn for being here. And I'm gonna turn it over to the president. I hope your FSU experience has been good. And so we've got we've got a shirt for you here to wear uh, about your FSU experience. But I, on my on my behalf, and I think everybody here, I, we could listen to you for another two or three hours. I'm sure, and very entertaining. Thank you for coming to Florida State University.